Well, hello there. You're watching the press preview, a first look at what is on the front pages as they come in. It's time to see what's making the headlines then with the Daily Mirror's associate editor, Kevin McGuire, and the columnist for the article, Ali Mirage. They will be with us right through until midnight. So, front pages then. Let's kick off with the Metro. According to the paper, some public transport staff are concerned that they will fall victim to aggression and violence when they try to enforce rules on masks in places like London and Scotland, where travellers will still need to wear them from Monday. The Financial Times again hears from bosses who are concerned that too many of their staff are being pinged by the NHS COVID app and forced into self-isolation. The Telegraph reports that the government intends to introduce new taxes on cars and motorcycles to encourage road users to go carbon neutral. And speaking of taxes, a report submitted to the government has recommended imposing a levy on junk food. That is according to the front page of the Daily Mail. But if you believe the research carried in the star, a can of beer or two glasses of wine a day could be good for you. According to The Sun, a man passed Wembley security without a ticket during the Euro 2020 final following 15 hours of drinking. And The Guardian leads with a climate story. They say that the balance has tipped in the Amazon as the rainforest now emits more carbon dioxide than it absorbs. So, Kevin, Ali, with their choices, um, starting with the Metro and masks, this is after Wales joined Scotland, joined the London Mayor and regional mayors in suggesting that, uh, Ali, that masks should still be mandatory. Where, where does this leave the government then? Well, and I think the government's uh, in a little bit of a mess on this one. Uh, we know that in the last couple of weeks when Sajid Javid became the new health secretary, the, the tone from the government actually changed ahead of this big reopening uh, next Monday. Uh, but since then, uh, in the light of the fact that uh, the polling is showing that the, the public is actually quite in favour of uh, the retention of masks, the government has rode back from that position uh, quite a lot and is now placing the onus on transport providers to actually make the decision on mask enforcement. So it's not going to be mandatory in law, but they're pushing it down to, in this case, um, TFL, Sadiq Khan has actually said that he will make it mandatory. It's not going to be mandatory in law. But what this means is that station staff are going to have to be put in this awkward position of confronting people where they don't really have mandatory powers in law to do that, which is going to put them in an awkward position. And it also is at odds with, as you say, what's happening in Wales and Scotland. So I think the buck is being passed. We've got to remember that masks, the government was very late to introduce masks in the first place. Last June, they introduced them on public transport and July in shop, months after the the, the first lockdown took place in March. So they, be, they were late to impose them, and now they're early to remove them. So it's a bit of a mess, I think. Yes, and indeed, uh, Mir the Mirror, I know, for Wednesday's paper, did a, a big double-page spread about, about face on masks. Today, though, the Transport Secretary, Grant Shapps, um, immediately urged rail firms to follow, you know, the London Mayor, Sadiq Khan, uh, and Scotland at the time, saying it's very much in line with what we expected, indeed wanted to happen. Um, is that fair, do you think? I would say no, Anna. If that's what the Transport Secretary wanted to happen, then the Transport Secretary leaves it in law, then it, then it will happen. It's almost uh, book-passing here. He's outsourced uh, the decision to others where he, he should say, no, look, I will make this work, because it is going to be chaos around the, the country. And I understand why um, some staff fear, uh, as the, the uh, RMT union said, the rail union, which represents a lot of, a lot of rail workers uh, on ticket barriers and, and so on, that uh, people who will say, no, no, we don't have to wear a mask, but you wanted to wear a mask. Uh, could you please wear a mask? And they say, say no. And you can get these confrontations because it's going to be a real mess. But Sadiq Khan in London has the power by, by ch uh, changing uh, regulations to almost make it you know, make it a, a condition that you have to uh, you have to follow to go on the system but we saw with the metro mayors the five metro mayors coming together five labor metro mayors including Tracy Braben in, in West York, they have the power to enforce mask wearing she can require masks to be worn in a bus station but the moment the bus pulls up and somebody gets on the bus she doesn't have the power to compel that and uh, Andy Street the West Midlands mayor is also in the same position he wants masks to, uh, to be worn on public transport but it can't be enforced I think the government's got this wrong politically and I think they're they're behind uh, public opinion as, uh, as Ali said because most people 
think wearing masks should remain a legal requirement on public transport. And I would also uh, suggest in shops too, particularly if you want to, uh, you, you want to protect those shop workers as well as the as the customers. And the government was slow to the party on this, but in fairness to the to the government, the World Health Organization was slow too and didn't change its uh, its guidance until uh, earlier this year because the whole focus was on passing um, COVID through through contact touch. And the fact it can be airborne and transmitted that way was, was overlooked for too long. Yes, uh, those metro mayors cover a wide area too. As you said, West Yorkshire, Greater Manchester, Liverpool City region, north of Tyne, west of England and South Yorkshire, uh, doubling up with the Labour mayor in London. Uh, but a series of um, government advice has been published, uh, Ali, including coming back to the office, advice for businesses, uh, which The Telegraph reports that pubs, restaurants and bars are being urged to check vaccine passports. This is interesting, isn't it? Because before it was, it felt like it was going to be nightclub clubs and that was it. What's the story here? Well, look, I have a, a specific interest in nightclubs, as you know, Anna, because I've got a gig coming up in Shoreditch on August the 13th, where I shall be spinning the deck. So I have an interest in getting this in this right. But it's now moved on from nightclubs. It's now uh, restaurants, as you say, and other hospitality venues that have already had a torrid time. Their takings are way down. They still have to uh, comply uh, up till now with social distancing. So they've got enough on their plate to deal with. Again, I think this is the government trying to pass the buck a little bit here and not being clear in its, in its actual uh, mandatory requirements of what it actually wants. I mean, there is a, still a feeling amongst the public, and this is also brought out in other countries with France uh, requiring these things uh, by law, uh, Portugal introducing these measures as well, that we seem to be going against the grain here by leaving it up to individuals, and in this case, uh, the hospitality sector, to decide these things. And I think what they want is clear rules. This is uh, difficult because you're going to have a hodgepodge of certain uh, restaurants imposing this, others not, and then you get this uh, division going on. And again, impositions on staff. And we're also seeing a number of people also getting pinged. The, the infection rate's above 40,000 now. The death rates are going up. Uh, so I still, still think you know these, these precautions should be being looked at by the, by the government and being imposed in law rather than pushing it on to the venues to decide for themselves. So the, mu the mood music from the government, Freedom Day, ministers, I can't wait to get my mask off, has now sort of shifted, has it not? Um, the Mail reporting that masks indoors, plastic screens, a slow return to work, why your office after Freedom Day will look remarkably like it does now. The advice to people who are shielding, this advice to hospitality, it's all way more cautious than the, the, than the tone that was set by the government before last Monday. No, absolutely, uh, Anna. I think the the prime minister was all gung uh, gung ho, but he's now see, he's seen those figures rising uh, for 40, 42,000 fresh infections, high since mid January. The link with death is severely weakened, but there were forty nine nonetheless uh, reported in the latest twenty four hour period. And I, and I think he he wants to pull off all the legal restrictions as many as he can, but then shift responsibility onto businesses, whether you're a pub, a club, a cafe, a shop, operating public transport. And it's almost as if he's trying to wash his hands legally now of responsibility. And I think that's a, that is a mistake because, one, we were told COVID passports wouldn't be coming in, so they want them now to come in in an informal way. But two, do you really think pubs, cafe, restaurants are going to be turning away customers if they don't have COVID passports when that's not required in law? Up, up to now, you were asked to, uh, to, to check in with your phone. You didn't have your phone. Most places required you to write your name and your, your number. Well, that's not, going to, that's not going to be required now. But they're not going to say, what well, you haven't got any proof you're double jabbed, so you, you can't come in. We just know it ain't, it ain't going to happen because if people can't get in one pub uh, because it is enforced, they'll go to another pub where it isn't enforced, and the pub that's enforcing it will realise it hasn't got any customers, so they'll, they'll stop doing it. It's a, the, the, lifting the whole legal architecture in this way is a huge risk and a gamble, and he knows that. Johnson, but he does seem to be trying to blame others. He's going to blame businesses that have had a terrible time if it all goes wrong. 
Yes, um, it's hard to do test and trace without any tracing, isn't it? Uh, and I think there have been protests in the streets of Paris after Macron said that COVID passports are, on, are a necessity. Um, and Ali, all very well having rising cases, but they don't happen in isolation, as the FT reports. Uh, the Delta variant is wreaking havoc on industry, the paper says, with more than 700 workers at the UK's largest car factory now self-isolating. Business groups warning that some companies are missing 20% of their staff Labour shortages, they say, have hit factories, shops, warehouses, with workers pinged by the NHS COVID app, told to isolate, etc, etc. It's not the first time we've heard this, but it, it presumably will only get worse. I think there is a problem here because there's a disconnect between this July the 19th grand reopening date uh, and the fact that uh, the restrictions on uh, if you're pinged uh, remaining at home for 10 days in self-isolation are only going to be lifted on August the 16th. So until that period, you have this situation where a number of people in the country, I mean, 66% have been double jabbed by now, but there are many who haven't been double jabbed. And even the people who are being double jabbed, or have been double jabbed rather, um, can still pick up the infection. So you've got this situation where until you get uh, to a later point in the year, a number of people are going to end up getting pinged by the NHS test and trace app and are going to have to sit at home for 10 days. Now, this is causing serious problems. It's causing problems to Nissan on its production uh, car plant up in Sunderland. It's also causing problems for Iceland, where, you know, um, causes problems for me because I like the bread that they serve in Iceland. So I'll be disappointed if there are shortages of, of that on the shelf. So there are serious problems out there, and we see that the CBI is pleading with the government to actually uh, try and bring this date forward uh, to Monday to, to abandon this uh, requirement to stay at home for 10 days because of the fact that it's going to affect so many workers. And this is before you get, Anna, to the NHS and the impact on the NHS stuff. We've already got a backlog of 5 million operations. And this is all go also going to affect a number of NHS staff and increase that backlog even more. Yes, and, and the, the, uh, the FT suggesting that hospitals in Leeds and Birmingham, among those having had to cancel or postpone operations, in part because so many staff are self-isolating. Certainly the NHS is probably where they'll look at that first. Both of you, stay there. Thank you very much indeed for now. But plans to impose banning orders on football fans who exhibit racist behaviour is where we turn our attention next. Back in just a moment. Well, welcome back. You're watching the press preview. With me now, Kevin Maguire and Ali Mirage. Welcome back to both of you. Um, so clearly, uh, the football, um, the racism, uh, the social media companies, and what to do about it has been part of the debate since uh, since Sunday's final, uh, which takes us to the metro and this idea about banning orders. Kevin, doesn't it? Yeah. No. Absolutely. Which which Labour have also called for Keir Starmer, but. Uh... Mm. Boris Johnson, a Prime Minister's question, said, uh, you know, have, have football supporters or people found guilty of racist abuse online will be banned from going to games. It happens at the moment of those who uh, are convicted of uh, violence or other offences at football games. Um, you wonder why it's, it's just those online. I mean, would you say that whoever uh, defaced the Marcus Rashford mural, for instance, shouldn't be banned? Um, but it, there's a petition calling for, um, I think it's signed by about a million people now, calling for a lifetime ban from football on these people. I, I wouldn't actually support that. I'm not going to be soft on racist or racist, but I do believe in redemption and uh, education and people changing as, as well as, as punishment. But you can see the, the Prime Minister wants to try and get a bit on the front foot to, to attack because he's a very torrid time in that the culture war he, he started is now losing the battle. Uh, and it, it began, really, once uh, the team became incredibly popular and he made that big mistake at the beginning, refusing to condemn those who were going to boo players when they took the knee. Well, all the racist abuses showing exactly why footballers feel the need to take the knee. And he struggled at Prime Minister's questions, too, over trying to defend uh, the, the Home Secretary after calling taking the knee gesture politics. What do you think Boris Johnson's all about gesture politics? That's what, that's what gets him, uh, him going. But I think he, he just backed the wrong side in yeah. this. I think it says a lot about him that isn't pleasant, and he backed the wrong side. Yeah, and the, the suggestion, Kevin, that too much focus against woke than on the fight against racism. But 30 seconds left, Ali. Lucky you. You've got the front page of The Sun to talk us through. Well, what can one say? I mean, this is a person who had been drinking for hours, 
uh, had uh, taken cocaine, tons of alcohol, and put a life flare in his posterior. So, uh, you know, whatever floats your boat, I guess. But um, he's not going to be going to any more football matches. So the problem with all of this is, Anna, that it really messes up our chances to host the World Cup in 2030 in a joint bid with Ireland. I mean, with this sort of behaviour going on. And it is a fringe Ali. of fans. I mean, most football fans just want to enjoy it. Sorry to rush you. Ali Mirage, Kevin Maguire. Thank you.